yes, they will absolutely, full preterist will absolutely show that what looks to be apocalyptic metaphorical, they'll say it looks apocalyptic because it's so, you know, the, the mountains will melt and the stars will fall. And what is it describing? The destruction of Babylon or the destruction of uh, Syria or whatever it might be. Um, it has this language. And you have spoke briefly about how um, Robert Carroll may think that in those situations, some of the Jews may have even thought this was really the end, um, but redactors may have come in and polished it up and said, okay, hold up, hold up. So it's a metaphor for what happened to this nation. But after Plato, and when you know you have Alexander the Great that really brings Hellenism to the world, which would include the philosophy of the Greeks, which has these layers of, of from staunch materialism where we're at kind of our lowest form to the highest level of like pure i guess you would say ether almost like the highest uh, spiritual pneuma level where there is no material necessarily like what we have it's a different kind of thing that can go all the way up um this material cosmos the the elements um will melt right we, we see this that is a problem paul constantly discusses flesh i know that that gets interpreted through full preterist lens of like law and they they want to say like flesh is law and law is this bad thing so it's like got a protestant -y kind of thing to it as well rather than seeing it as like no this probably even is like a dispute between other law type factions of jews and his version of the law of Christ, which is not the same kind of law. So we have like this weird diaspora dispute probably happening amongst Paul and other Jewish sects. It's not like anti-Torah to the point of like, have nothing to do with it. No, he talks about it being a, a teacher, um, not a bad thing. Long story short though, what I thought what you did was great is pointing out how they hermeneutically leap and they overwhelmingly reference the Hebrew scripture as an interpretive model for the new. So they, they jump to Isaiah says, and Micah says, and Hosea says, and such and such says, and this is the same problem with a splinter sect from full preterism called Israel only. This group goes even further. And you've probably never even heard of this group, but just to whet your appetite, they believe the end happened in 70. That most of them don't believe at all anymore. Most of them, they believe that the Gentiles, the nations, that term shouldn't be Gentiles. They don't like that. They don't like Goyim or, or Gentiles to mean non-Israelites. They'll say it means non-Jews, but Jews only encompass the Southern tribes. These nations were the 10 Northern lost Israelites, the tribes of the Israelites. So the gathering of the lost Israelites needed to come in before the end. They interpret this model that the Goyim, the ethne, the the nations are actually the diaspora from the Assyrian conquest where the northern Israel was destroyed and they were scattered among the nations of the earth. That, that Paul's mission is to save the lost Israelites. And that's who these people are. And they're bringing them in. Th there's no end to how full preterism will, will go at any length to make these things hermeneutically and theologically make sense. But back to full preterism, just the basic forms of it that is the majority view, like they aren't realizing how much recontextualization is taking place in the New Testament when it's quoting. There is Christopher D. Stanley, who I think is the leading guy on this. He, he talks about Paul's misuse of scripture. And it's misuse if we're reading it as if Paul means what he's quoting. He never means, literally never, in any reference he ever quotes, Take me to task on this. Go watch my videos on this with Christopher D. Stanley. There's not a single reference where Paul quotes the Hebrew scriptures and he means exactly what the context says in the Hebrew scriptures. Never. Oftentimes, you if you had Paul's, like imagine we didn't have the Hebrew scriptures and we discovered them one day and we were like reading Paul, we would think that, for example, you shall not muzzle an ox. And I mentioned this yesterday, right? You would think, okay, hold on. Maybe the law is actually a spiritual lesson about the apostles, but it's foretold and foreshadowed. We go to read that in the in original context. These guys really worried about cattle and really cared about how the animal abuse was taking place or how you should treat your animals because they were agricultural. They were trying to survive. They never had in mind these future apostles that are running around. Pay those guys. Yeah, you got to pay them, man. So the way Paul uses scripture is not what it originally meant. 
That's not even getting into what you said, Matt, because what you said is like, yeah, I agree with you, Derek. I, there's this recontextualization and they're using it as if it's a living document to their own means and purposes. But by the time of the first century, if we use a heuristic approach, comparing apocalyptic literature as John J. Collins and others have, you have a cosmic end of human history ex expectation taking place. And the language is very similar to what we're finding in, in Paul in the New Testament, in the Gospels, yet we're supposed to run and say this all means metaphorical or all is some like corporate spiritual thing when all of the Jewish literature around there, Second Temple literature, late Second Temple literature, is saying this stuff with the same thing in mind. So like it's, it's again, a special pleading kind of thing like, oh, but this doesn't mean that because this is true rather than, well, what do Jews think? And that's why Schweitzer and others who came in and said, we need to set this text within Jewish context, at least to try and see what did Jews think? What were Jews expecting? They weren't thinking in Ezekiel of like just nationalistic corporate, some metaphor to ex describe our nation never ending. And one of the views Don K. Preston leading guy has is corporate body view. And there's others who have individual body view. All right. So he thinks the resurrection is the corporate body of Christ is some spiritual bride. And like, it's not individualistic. Whereas the individual body view of full preterists say, when you die to be absent from the Lord is to be present or to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And they think when you die, you then face judgment and stuff like that. So there's different forms of it. And they aren't in agreement in full preterism because the New Testament isn't in agreement. I'm done rambling. Your turn. <laughs> no, I, I don't have anything to anything to say in response to that. But I mean, it's just as with any kind of apologetic approach to the Bible or anything, it's just, you know, if you're going to think historically, you cannot be an apologist because it, it, it is corrosive to the aims of trying to think historically about any text. You have your interest, first and foremost, has to be what is this author saying in this context at this time and place? And you have to be devoted to that and that only. If you're also devoted to agreeing with them, if you're if you if you have a prior commitment that what they say must be true and it must agree with all of these 65 other books, um, then you, you're you at least have to recognize the potential that you are going to be twisting what that author is saying in order to fit it with those other authors or vice versa. And that's not how you do interpretation of anything. That is not the way to go. Don't, don't be an apologist because you're going to find yourself doing exactly the kinds of things that full preterists do. Um, and, go just bending yourself into the craziest knots in order to try and come out the other side and say, Jesus wasn't wrong. Um, yeah. I got a couple examples, couple examples, and then we'll wrap up. But first thing is in the Acts 1 Ascension narrative, several academics who are in New Testament scholarship who aren't as critical as the scholars I like the most um, try to find Jewish precedents for this, for these narratives we find. And I get it. It's easy to find it is written. So if it's written, you know, they're using scripture. So they only want to look there instead of the larger zeitgeist of the world in which this literature is in. And it's all written in Greek, mind you. So you're like, all right, you're already dealing with people who are in a Greek culture with a Greek writing style with Greek literature screw the fact that there's all this other Greek literature. We need to focus on only the Greek book of the LXX. Get out of my face with that, okay? So Allison agreed, just to get in one point, about the Romulus connection. Well, I, I just want to highlight that for everybody who's watching that might be full preterist, who's never heard that the ascension of Jesus in Acts 1-8 is actually a Romulus kind of retelling, but Jesus is greater than Romulus. And there's more witnesses there, not just one. So they're watching him go up. They see him with their eyeballs leave. There's a term there, and I don't know the Greek word off the top of my head, but it's in like manner, you will see him come back. What do they do? They find this Greek term being used in Matthew 23. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks. See, in like manner doesn't mean literal, and, and it's just silly. So I want you to comment just briefly on that, of course, and then I want to run to Revelation. No, I mean, it's... it's Without even getting into the Greek, you can see how ridiculous that is, because if you just use the word like, you can see from different contexts in Acts 1, 
you know, in like manner, just as he ascended, he will also descend. You can see that that the use of the word like there is not being used in the sense of metaphor or a simile, but is saying in the same way that he left, he will also return. Read Matthew 23, how I wanted to gather you like a mother hen. Gather. It's clear that that is a simile. Context, context, context. Like you can't just be jumping around and saying, because a word is used this way in one place in this context means it must be used in that way in every other place. That's not how we do interpretation. That's not how we do. That's not how etymology works. Like it's like me saying, you know, if, if, uh, if I said, you know, the, if I use the word gay, you say, well, you know, if you go back a hundred years, the way people use the word gay in literature a hundred years ago, it meant happy. And therefore I must be just saying I'm happy. And it's like, well, no, time and place matters. Context matters. Etymology matters. You can't just jump around like that and say, because a word hundreds of years ago was used in one way or in a different time and place, it was used in one way. It must be used that way in another place. That's not how language works. 